So of course, as you can imagine, there were multiple levels of fascination. The first fascination was with the people of these traditions. Here we have Sanskrit, and I was fascinated by the people who came up with all of these ideas, the people who uh, saw Hinduism as being a source of wisdom and strength and guidance. And I wondered what was going on in their hearts, what was going on in their minds. And here I decided that I just had to know something about these letters. The letters, as may be the case for you, were just so intriguing to me that I decided that the only way that I can possibly understand their wisdom is if I delved into their letters and understood what are they saying, what are these sounds, and uh, what, does, what do these sounds and these ideas mean to these people. And so what I would do is I just wrote these on the wall, and I would have them just sitting on the wall so that I could see them day in and day out, day in and day out. And so I hoped that eventually the concepts and the images and the graphics and the figures and these shapes would somehow go into my mind and become something that was part of me. And believe it or not, a strange thing happened as time went on. I actually began to see myself as a Hindu, as a person who felt those beliefs, those gods, whether it was Vishnu or Krishna. They lived in me and their ideas and the stories that have made them so powerful and so important to people. Right over here, as we move on, of course, one of my favorite languages is Arabic. And of course, because I studied Hebrew and so it was, it was really fun to look into the Arabic and see, well, what about Arabic sounds like uh, my language? And what about Arabic shape? The shapes of the letters uh, also spoke to me, meaning which of the letters look like the letters that I'm accustomed to. And so here I'll just step back for a second so you can see it. And of course, right here I actually write an entire passage from the Torah in Arabic so that I can get comfortable with what does, how the Torah would sound in Arabic, because I know the story from the Torah, and I thought, well, that's an easy way to learn Arabic, because I'll be able to easily contrast uh, how are the words said in Arabic, and how are they said in Hebrew. Uh, now, believe it or not, I know this looks like Arabic, but it's not. It's actually Persian. Persian is usually written in a different style lettering called Nastalikh, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, but I decided to write it in very simple Arabic letters so I could read it. And Persian is an absolutely beautiful language. It's a very romantic language. It's, this happens to be Rumi, so of course it's just fascinating and it's all about love and kindness and, and, and seeking meaning in that profound union with the divine, however one would understand that, that divinity. Now, I know you notice those lines there. I know this sounds odd, but the lines are actually scribbles that I make so that I could remember the words. So I just find it hard sometimes to remember these things, so I just scribble and scribble and scribble again and again, and somehow uh, the scribbling uh, actually helps me remember the word. Now, right here, this is an... an odd kind of alphabet chart I made so I could see different letters in different languages. So, for example, I might be able to see how a P sound is made in Greek and a P sound in Sanskrit and a P sound in, uh, uh, say, uh, Georgian. And so I might be able to look at those letters and wonder, well, I wonder which of those letters actually have a relationship. For example, you might see there on the bottom the SH in uh, Russian. If you're familiar with the Shin in Hebrew that has the three prongs, the SH in Russian actually looks similar to the Shin of Hebrew. And one would wonder why that is the case. But of course it's the case because Cyril, who created the Cyrillic alphabet, was a priest. And he studied Hebrew, and there's a good chance that he just looked at the Shin in Hebrew and said that would be a nice way to use the shin in Russian or to make the SH sound in Russian. So 
That's just a fun fact. At least I think it's a fact. It sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, Cyril definitely traveled up from the Byzantine Empire and brought, uh, brought Christianity up to the Russians. So, here we have Tibetan. Now, of course, you're going to see a lot of scribbles. And there's a lot of scribbles because it was freaking hard. Uh, Tibetan was probably the hardest language to study. Really difficult to wrap my brain around it. Um, and oddly enough, the only way to actually be able to draw in the language is to really feel the language deeply inside. And so it took a very long time to feel Tibetan inside. To be honest, I'm not even sure I got there completely. It was really, really hard. Um, because it's just... The language is old and it's cumbersome, especially... This is old Tibetan. It's probably about a thousand years old. Uh, what you're looking here is actually the... Uh, this is the text from the Diamond Cutter Sutra. And believe it or not, the Diamond Cutter Sutra is the oldest book in the entire world. Uh, so I, I believe the oldest book that we have that is printed with wooden blocks uh, was printed in China, and it's printed in Chinese. So this is obviously not Chinese, but this is the text from the Diamond Cutter Sutra, which obviously was so important to the Chinese that they actually... That's the first book that they printed. Now, of course, they may have printed other books, but this is the first book that we have in existence. I believe it's from 869. Now, I know this is upside down. You see that? Uh, I just made it that way just in case your eyes were on the side of your head. But actually, uh, this used to be on my ceiling. Actually, no, that's not true. It was on the wall. But again, this is also Tibetan, the Tibetan words in English, so that I can get comfortable with the sounds they make and uh, the shapes that are related to the sounds. Here again is Tibetan written one more time. Again, I had to write these over and over again just to get a little comfortable with the letters. And as you might be able to tell there, uh, I'm, I'm starting to play around with the letters. If you're familiar with the uh, Tibetan alphabet, you can tell that some of these letters are actually... I'm just starting to play with them, and that's part of the process of not only writing the letter, but playing with it. Now, attached to the bottom there, believe it or not, that is Ethiopic, or Ge'ez. And uh, to be honest, I don't know which text that is, because I was intrigued by Ge'ez language. And I decided I had to make a piece in Ge'ez, and I didn't know which piece I would make. First, I was looking into writing Paul, uh, Paul's vision on the way to Damascus. And then later, I decided on picking a piece from Isaiah instead. Uh, so at this moment, I cannot tell what this is. I have to look at it carefully. Because basically, I believe Jesus calls to Paul and says, I think he says, Saul, Saul. And I'm looking to see if those two words, Saul, Saul, are in there. Uh, okay, I don't see it now. But either way, that is Ge'ez. And um, yeah, that piece uh, will be in another video to actually see how it turned out. Now, right here on the wall is, obviously this is in English, and these are scriptures from the Bhagavad Gita, some of my favorite scriptures. And I just wrote them on the wall so that I could see them all the time and meditate on them to decide which piece would I finally pick. Because it takes a long time to actually make the piece. And so I decided to study them. You see the words? That action which is regulated, which is performed without attachment, without love or hatred, and without desire for fruitive results, is said to be in the mode of goodness. And I just absolutely love this because that is one of the treasures of the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita has all kinds of profound wisdom, but one of them, which I have not really found in 
many other traditions is the detachment from results. So the Bhagavad Gita actually asks us to take action, do our duty, and not be concerned with the results. Here is one more alphabet chart, which you can tell. See that? Uh, that's another way of writing, or for me, putting on the wall all the different alphabets so that I can take a look at them and, again, match one to the other and see which alphabets are similar to the other. I'll continue some more of this in just a moment, but I think this is going to be enough for this video. I hope you're enjoying it.